So I just said that what is unit testing and why testing is important. So we are going now to discuss unit testing. So let's, for example, when we, I asked you to, to write um, the code for the first assignment, uh, I asked you to write a couple of functions and I asked you to write tests for that function, okay? So the idea of a test is to write small programs that exercise the function in uh, uh, many different ways with the goal of finding bugs okay uh, so one of the goal actually is to find bugs another goal is to uh, guarantee that later on if you are going to change something in the function the function continues to work okay so Mm, suppose, for example, that you are writing the function for intersecting two sets, like in the first assignment. And the first try, you just uh, apply a very simple function that is going to try all combination from the first set to see if it's the same as uh, the same element in the second set. And if the two sets are not ordered, you are going to do all the combinations. Okay, so you write tests to actually check that given two sets, they actually, uh, the result of the function is actually the intersection, so the common elements to both sets. So later on, you decide to change that uh, implementation and to try it with vectors. And uh, since you can sort a vector, you can actually try to first sort the vector and then to uh, apply an algorithm that uh, takes advantage of the fact that the two, elem uh, the two ele sets are uh, sorted. In that way, the complexity of the algorithm is reduced. Uh, anyway, are we sure that the new implementation is still conforming to the original? Well, if you already have the tests, you can just recompile and check that the new version is going to work. So actually, uh, the test is useful also for regression. Okay, Regression testing means you are going to check that over time even if you change something in that function or somewhere else in the code the test is still uh, okay is still correct okay another example is the list of substitution principle consider for the example uh, in the list of substitution principle so for uh, you have uh, a class rectangle and you are going to check that the rectangle is correctly used. So you write a test for checking that uh, the class rectangle is correct. Then later on you decide to, <coughs> to derive from a rectangle a square and then you make assumptions and you make restriction on the sides of the two um, uh, of, the, uh, of the two um, of the elements inside the, the rectangle and then you run again the test and you may discover that uh, the Lisco substitution principle is not uh, valid anymore because you changed uh, something in the way you are going to use the rectangle okay so you can discover things like that uh, by doing a regression testing okay. uh, so the main problem with writing tests, as I said, is that testing is a boring activity because it works against human nature and it works against what the programmer thinks is very important to do. Okay? Usually every programmer likes to exercise his own intelligence in writing something useful. So you have an algorithm to implement, so you try to apply your intelligence to find the best algorithm to solve the problem and that is a very um, very nice thing to do it's very uh, very nice activity but then checking that your algorithm really works means to write tests and writing tests is means to write a lot of additional code because you have to write uh, the main you have to write the input you have to write the testing code, you have to run the tests, you have to co check that the uh, actual results of the test are correct, and then once you write the test code, 
you have uh, to continue maintaining the, ch the, the code. And that means that later on, you have to keep that in sync with the rest of the, the source. So if you are going to change a little bit the interface, probably you are going to change a lot of uh, uh, testing code. Mm -hmm. Most of this work is not funny. Okay, So uh, the programmer wants to do something inventive, wants something that rewards him. So as a consequence, most programmers, they simply do not test. So they write the program, they just do a little bit of checking that everything is okay, it compiles at maybe one single run to see if it works, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. Testing is time consuming. There is never enough time, and most programmers are always under pressure to finish on time. So he has to concentrate on important things like producing application code. Uh, also, there is another problem. When you write testing, testings, tests are programs, and programs may contain bugs. So if you have some problem uh, with your tests, it may be a bug in your program, or it may be a bug in your test. So what you can happen is that you are going to produce false positives. Or maybe you are going to hide some bug because if a bug in the test code cancels with a bug in the in the production in the function then uh, of course you don't discover that uh, there are these couple of bugs and so on and so forth you may force programmers to write tests but that's not the right approach because since it works against human nature after a while the programmer will stop anyway uh, unless, so the first thing to do is to try to automatize a little bit the testing, okay? So uh, the programmer should not spend time in checking the output of the test to see if everything is okay. So the check that the test is uh, correct, produces correct result or fails, should be done automatically by the PC. So the only thing the programmer wants to see when it's run a test is okay or fail. It doesn't want to see endless screens of text output that has to be manually checked. Okay? Then the second important thing is to be able to run suites of tests. All tests should be grouped into a suites and it should be possible to compile and execute them with one single command. So as soon as a new test is written, it is added to the test suite and executed along with the other tests. So this is, for example, what happened uh, in uh, what happens in Metascene. Okay, so this is um, so in Metascene, you can compile the code with Make, and you can compile and run the tests with make check. With one single command, you, you compile all tests, and then all tests are immediately run. Okay? And so this is the output. And as you can see, the output is quite simple to read because you see the screen characters, and they say that the test number uh, one is running, and then the result is okay and the test number two is running, and the test is okay. And so this is three more tests from Persutil, and they all run, and everything is okay, and so on and so forth. Okay? So it's easy in the, to check the result. And we don't even care what these tests are about, as long as they are correct. If instead we find some bug in a test, then uh, the test will not hopefully will not complete correctly. So you are going to see a, a red character with fail, and then you go in the test and see what's going, what's going on. So the idea is that you write tests and you accumulate them into test suites. And then you run them with one single command and check the output. Uh, tests, when to write a test? You can write a test after you coded, 
and you could write a test before coding. These are two different approaches. So you can have test first or test after. Test first means you first write the test and the code is not there. Writing the test means actually uh, understanding what are the uh, constraints and the requirements of your code. It's sort of uh, uh, writing down what are the requirements of the things you are going to implement. So you start by writing the test. After you write the test, you write your code, then you compile and you execute the test and you check that everything is okay. Until uh, there is some test that returns uh, with fail, you continue developing uh, and so completing uh, your implementation so that everything works. So writing a test first is more or less like writing the requirements. And until the requirements are not satisfied, you continue to code. Uh, you should run tests often. Run tests often means run tests every time you compile. The habit of running tests should be automatically embedded in the development tool. So in addition to I should make my program compile, the objective should also be I should make all the tests run smoothly because compiling is not enough. Okay. So the final objective of using this kind of approach is to try to substitute debugging with testing. So when you actually write your program, to see if it is correct, there are two approaches. You can debug and you can test. Okay. So testing is done while coding. So you code and you test, you code and you test, alternatively, one after the other. Debugging instead is done later on, when you find uh, some problem. Testing is a special kind of coding, it's actually writing code. Debugging instead means to slowly going through existing code, line by line, in a painful way, uh, often under pressure, because you often you find a bug and you have to solve it at the very last minute when uh, you have to uh, deliver your code. Mm -hmm. And another advantage of tests over debugging is that tests are there to stay. So once you write a test, it's there, and you can run that automatically at any time. Debugging in instead is something you do manually, and this most of the time was waste the time because you see the program executing line by line but uh, you cannot reuse this information it's just something that stays there and uh, if the bug uh, comes out again and in the future you have to debug again so certainly you will be convinced that testing may be more funny than debugging because it's actually coding rather than just going through the code. And maybe you will also become convinced that testing may be very productive because uh, it can drastically reduce the amount of time spent in debugging. And the more time you spend in testing, the, more, the less time you spend in debugging. So your productivity actually increases. Uh, Okay, so something we are going to talk uh, after this is the, uh, the need to address changes in our software. The need to address changes in our software comes from the fact that software is subject to change anyway, because uh, the customer may change his requirements or may add new requirements or because you realize that something has been done in a completely different way, or because you want to optimize some piece of code, or because you want to reuse existing code in a different way, and so on and so forth. So you will need to change existing code or to add additional code functionality. And in doing so, you want to make sure that what already exists continues to work, so does not break. 
If it does break, maybe you introduced a bug in the code that breaks existing code. Or maybe you violated an assumption made by existing code, for example, the, consider again the least cost substitution principle. Or maybe you need to change the test because the specification has changed and the test is not valid anymore. In all cases, if you have a test and you are, have a regression test, you can check this easily. If you don't have it, well, there is no way to understand what's going on and what is go and what's not happening. Okay. So in any case, since you test every time you compile, you can immediately spot the error. So spotting the error immediately means to solve it as soon as you program. So you program, you introduce the bug as soon after you discover that something broke. So you can come back and look again at what you did and try to do something different. If you don't have the possibility to run tests when you compile, you may discover that you introduced a, a nasty bug during integration testing, so much, much later. And so what happens is, uh, is you have to go back and trace back the problem, debug your code, and then maybe you don't remember what's going on. You don't remember the steps you did for implementing the new thing. And uh, it's more, much more difficult to spot the error. So at the end, what is more time consuming is the second approach. So it's true that writing a lot of tests adds a lot of overhead to the programmer. But it's also true that uh, it can save you some time later on. Um, how to write tests? Of course, as I said, you can never do a complete testing coverage in the unit test because that would mean too many tests to write. So the ability of the programmer and the ability of the tester is to write a few meaningful tests. And what does it mean, meaningful? Usually, what you need to do is to check boundary conditions. So it's not that you have to check and concentrate on normal behavior, but rather you have to concentrate on what happens at boundaries. For example, what if the function needs a file and the file does not exist? Or what if I try to extract from an empty container, will I get an error or a random uh, element? What if I pass a negative value while the function expects a positive one? What if I run my intersection function on uh, two empty sets? What is one of the two sets is actually empty? Or what if the original sets have uh, repeated uh, elements? And so on and so forth. So basically, what you have to do is to write a couple of tests for normal cases, just to see that in normal condition that your function works OK. And then write tests to exercise strange conditions, unusual input, something that it was not expected when we wrote the specification. Uh, okay, so writing test is actually a special ability. You have to understand how to stress your code and check the boundary condition. Uh, of course, testing cannot substitute completely debugging because uh, you can never be exhaustive, as I said. So at some point, a bug will come up. But that's not a problem because as soon as you discover a bug by debugging, you can immediately write a unit test and check that the error will never occur again in the future modification. So you spot the error by debugging, you write a test to show that the error exists, and immediately you solve the problem. You run the test again to see that the bug has disappeared and the test will stay mm -hmm. so that if by chance the bug appears again because you do some other modification you can immediately find it by compiling and running the tests uh, okay 
So other advantages, these are minor advantages, but actually quite important. Tests are useful as documentation, because if you don't know how to use a function, you can sometimes look at the test, the exercise, the function, to see how to use that. Uh, another Im interesting thing is that uh, when writing tests, you concentrate on the interface. So this is why it's important to write the test before writing the function, because you are basically specifying the interface of the function. So while writing tests, you wear the client app, while writing the code, you wear the implementer hat. So writing tests is a little bit similar to writing a specification for the code and exercising the specification. Also, it's what is nice is that you have a clear point of which you are done. When all tests are working correctly. So this has been elaborated by uh, Kent Beck in one uh, of his books, which is called Extreme Programming, and where he proposed a methodology called Extreme Programming Methodology. And in particular, if we focus on tests, he proposes what is called the test-driven development. So the test-driven development works like this. At the beginning, you write a test. Of course, you try to apply the test to the to your function. Since your function does not exist yet, the test will fail. Will fail to file to compile or will fail to execute. Since the test fails, you write production code. So you start implementing your function. When you think you are finishing implementing the function, you run the tests. You continue running the test until there is some test that fails. When you have all tests that succeed, so they run correctly, you can clean up code and repeat. Okay? Write a test, check if the test files, write production code, run all tests, and so on and so forth. So, developing software like that is driven by tests. So you first write the test and then you write the code. This is a little bit uh, a little bit extreme, but in fact the book is called Extreme Programming, so they, it proposes a very extreme ways of looking at software engineering. Another practice related to uh, testing and agile programming is called continuous integration, and this is applied in some companies, and is actually a um, a process for software development called Scrum that is based on continuous integration in test-driven programming and uh, in general in all those uh, practice for agile development. So continuous integration consists in uh, having somewhere a server which is dedicated to compilation, testing and repository and everything in one single development cycle. So basically, you write your test, then you write your code, then you push a button, and the test and the code is compiled, and the test is run. If the test runs correctly, everything is okay, and you can commit your code. If the test doesn't run correctly, you cannot commit your code. So basically, you can commit in the central repository only if your program compiles, but also only if your all tests are passed. And this is checked by a single push, pushing a single button in the development environment. Okay. So you need, of course, appropriate tool support for this, for doing this, and autopilot and automate all steps. And also you need a certain rigorous and structured approach because you have need to impose all this practice to all programmers. Okay? So basically, uh, let's see if I remember some continuous integration tool. You can look on Google, of course. I 
of course there is Wikipedia where you find everything. So continuous integration and let's see if we find some tools. So this is a, a lot of software tools for continuous integration. As you can see there are many, many of them. Okay, There are some from Microsoft, Microsoft Team Foundation Server. Uh, there is somebody produced by Apache, which is the um, consortium which uh, provides support for the Apache web server. Then uh, you can have uh, Cascade, this is one of the most uh, uh, popular. Then uh, Cruise Control, this is dedicated to Java, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is software, it costs a lot uh, most of the times which runs on a server and which provides not only repositories like git or uh, cvs or svn but also a way to integrate uh, compilation and tests on the same platform um, okay so continuous integration okay so having mm, talked about tests now it's time to go and talk about uh, agile uh, programming what is agile design and agile programming uh, okay so I, I will try to follow the same scheme followed by Kent Beck in his book uh, on extreme programming and on uh, agile development so we are going to talk about software engineering so controlling the process of development software by a group of people so what you have is uh, a group of people, you have something to develop, and uh, you want to do that on time without spending too much. You want the software to be of high quality and with a larger scope that is possible because your software should be the best that is possible. Okay? So the four variables for your software process are cost, you can put more or less money on your uh, on your developing your software. Then you have time, which is how much time do you have to develop your software. Quality, the quality you want to achieve. And scope, the amount of features you want to put into your software. Okay. So you can look at this as a sort of game, the software development game you have external forces customers and managers and they can pick the value of three out of four variables and the other variables of course uh, it's dependent on the other one on the, the first three so you cannot choose it the goal is to uh, do uh, software development in a successful way so develop the software at the least possible cost and with highest quality okay there are some managers that think they can control all the four variables but that's of course is not true you can consider that putting more money probably is going to increase the quality maybe it's going to reduce the time we don't know uh, or maybe it's going to increase the scope but for sure there is some dependency between all these four variables so cost you can put more money on it more money means uh, for example adding more programmers or having less programmers but with higher qualities i mean good programmers need to be paid more so you can have uh, very good programmers which you have to pay a lot or um, medium programmers but you can have many of them okay so more money can grease the skids a little but too much money too soon creates more more ma uh, problems that it solves and i'm going to explain that um, basically when you have to develop a software it's very difficult to start with a very big team for example suppose you have to build a large software for i don't know controlling or for a you know for a bank accounting uh, systems that you're going to to sell to the first bank in your country and uh, how you are going to start do you start with 100 programmers do you start with 200 programmers uh, if I want to do that in one month I'm going to start with one 
thousand programmers, well, uh, it's very difficult to control too many people working on a project. So what this sentence means is that sh usually it's better to start little. So you start with a good amount of money, but not too many, so that you can start with a small team and uh, build your software uh, uh, step by step and increasing it a little bit uh, a little bit at time. Okay, so start little. Of course, if there is too little money, the project will fail for sure because there is not enough for making it start. So you need a good amount of money, but not too much. Time. If you have more time to deliver, you can spend more time in improving the quality and increase the scope, which means in implementing more features. However, too much time is going to hurt because the best feedback is from the real product in the market. So, I don't know, if you want to develop a new app for your uh, Android phone, okay? How much time do you need? You say, okay, I need three months. So the other one is going to say, okay, I give you one year so you can make it very, very good. Well, that is not going to work because uh, how you are going to test, how do you know it's going to be very, very good? If after three months you finish it, how you are going to improve it? You need to feedback from the market you need feedback from real users so too much time is not going to improve quality a lot because until you actually release the product it's very difficult to get a good feedback third variable quality quality is the most difficult to control because you can sacrifice sometimes a little bit of quality and gain a little in the very short term suppose for example you have to deliver your software in one week. Well, mm. if you have to deliver in one week, then maybe there is not so much time to uh, make very good quality software. So what you have to do is to program in a hurry. Programming in a hurry means the quality is not going to be good. So you can sacrifice quality and gain a little bit in the short term but in the long term you are going to get larger problems because if you introduce defects in the quality of the software in the early stage then uh, these defects are going to accumulate and at the end is going to become a mess so quality is the most difficult to control scope is the final one scope means the number of features are going to put in your software less scope makes it possible to deliver better quality developer sooner and or cheaper so scope is one of the best variables less feature means best software there is not an easy relationship between the variables because often you can speed up a project by spending more money for example hiring more, more programmers <coughs> but sometimes hiring more programmers can hurt because you need more coordination the new ones have to learn and so on and so forth so if you are in a hurry if for example you are already late in delivering your project hiring more programmers is going to make things worse cost is the most constrained variable because the investment has to start small and grow over time and of course you cannot ask too much but you cannot ask too little so cost is the one on which we are going to reason more Constraints on cost makes the manager crazy. The reason they, the managers, usually reason on an annual budget. So they say, okay, this year I have, uh, I don't know, 50,000 euros, okay? So I can spend only 50,000 euros. And I don't care if you need more. That's what I'm going to spend because I have my budget. Or they can say, okay, I have a lot of budget this year and I'm not, going to be able to spend before the end of the year so i'm going to put everything on you so i'm going to give you i don't know one million euros because uh, if i don't spend this before the end of the year then i'm going to r run into trouble okay 
so managers drive everything from cost so this has to be known if you are going to work in a company you have to understand that a manager is first and most important variable is cost so they only reason on cost cost also has to do has to do with prestige the higher the cost of the project the bigger is the manager so uh, for example at the beginning of the year for a manager is very important to get a large budget and at the end of the year is very important for a manager to spend all his budget because this means that you know he was able to deliver so this is a quite important things to know when dealing with the companies time is also often external variables because there is market pressure because the deadlines is not something we decide it's something that somebody else is going to decide so market pressure they are going to put artificial deadlines in the middle so time is uh, something is very difficult to control Quality is a strange variable. Often by insisting on quality for the beginning, you get more project in smaller time. So it's a strange variable, it's counterintuitive. If you sacrifice in quality, you are going in the long run to be in a bad situation. If you spend a lot of time in quality, your manager is not going to be happy, but in the long run, you are going to have very, very good results. And finally, scope. Scope is the only one variable that can be controlled easily because uh, less scope means less time to deliver something meaningful, less cost, more control on timing, opportunity to achieve a higher quality, and so many good things. So remember, when you go to work and you are asked to deliver, try to put the least that is possible as number of features in your software because by controlling scope and by reducing a keep scope constraint you are going to have more possibility to deal with the other three variables okay so scope is the only variable that you can actually deal with it okay so we are going to have a break for uh, 15 minutes so we start again at 3.10. In the meanwhile, if somebody wants to ask questions on uh, the project or something else, I'm here for, for answering. And I don't know if Pontedera uh, you heard, but I decided that the exam is going to be on June the 10th. Okay, so the June the 10th in the morning, I will be in Pisa and uh, I'm going to do the first exam. The second exam instead is going to be July 19. Okay, so June the 10th, first round, July 19, second round. Thank you. It was easy, no broken ending today. It's the last lecture, so I can be just attention. Oh yeah, it was uh, very non-mathematical. Today, yes, not mathematical. I mean, software engineering is not mathematical. I didn't get the other sessions. The other were more technical. I mean, programming techniques. It's so quite interesting. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank